to Some Dare Call It Conspiracy with Brentley and Neil Sanders. We've all had a run in or two with trolls, especially those of us who are challenging disinformation. But what happens when it goes too far? We spoke with three victims of online stalking and harassment to share their stories. This is part one, Nat's story. Tell us who you are and what you like to speak about. I am Nat. I am an assistant practitioner in microbiology. I joined Twitter, it was a long time ago actually, but I never really used it. It was always more difficult to use than other social media, so I didn't really get into it until the pandemic, and I saw it as an opportunity as somebody who was running the SARS-CoV-2 testing to just impart some of that knowledge, uh, maybe debunk some misconceptions around PCR and ease my knowledge to help. I've never touted myself as an expert. I just sort of have that a little bit of experience in the field. So yeah, that was my my sort of reason for joining Twitter. When you say you're doing the testing, what does that actually mean? I'm assuming you're, you're doing lab work, t- looking at the, the tests and, and seeing whether the results are positive or negative. Is, is that accurate? Yes, yeah. So we receive a sample for a patient, process it, put it on the machine, wait for it to finish, and then we can see the result. Yeah, that's all there is to it, really. I think people think PCR is some very complicated like machinery, and for the most part, it's very easy. So you essentially just pipette the sample into a cartridge, load it on the machine, click go, and the machine does all the work for you. That We can't change the number of cycles. We can't do anything like that. It's all preset by the manufacturer. The same number of cycles every time for every single patient. We don't change the number depending on like whether we want more positives or more negatives. You know, it's, it's, that's absolute rubbish. It's all preset and it's not the number of cycles that matters. It is the CT value, which is the result of the test. People conflate CT with cycle number. It's not the same thing. Could you, in theory, I mean, just like just put a line, draw a line under this, is there any way that you can manipulate, manipulate these tests to give false positives? Or, or is that just one of these whole cloth myths that came from the internet? Not unless you intentionally contaminate the cartridge, like, or well, the machinery. Like, no, you can't manipulate it at all. It finds material. And if that material is not present, then it, you're not going to get the positive response, exactly. regardless of how many times you run it through a bicycle. Yeah, you could run. Process. 10,000 cycles and you would still get for the same sample and you would still get the same CT value and that CT value would inform you whether it's a positive or a negative. Excellent. So I imagine it was pretty busy, um, obviously, uh, during the uh, uh, COVID. So uh, again, the the way that he's tested, that's all standard. They just come in, you basically put them through a process or whatever. There's no way that you can manipulate them. There's no way that you can alter it. It's all, I assume, fairly pretty sterile as well because obviously you know you're not wanting to uh to to, to muck about with these things as well it, would that be true yep yeah, yep yeah, we all do it's also aseptic technique gloves cleaning our hands between specimens cleaning the micro, micro safety cabinet between specimens um everything is done aseptic technique we do environmental controls to make sure that our our machines aren't contaminated and our workspaces aren't contaminated uh, we also do positive and negative controls to make sure that the the cartridges are working and that the um the machine is actually picking up on stuff because otherwise you would just get constant negatives and not be picking up on the positives we do um quality controls on any new batches of cartridges that come through and also every single test has an internal control just to make sure everything's everything's working like within that specific test so so you're working with these tests you're you're obviously aware of how they work and you're aware of some of the sort of things that you've heard on the internet that just don't make any sense that obviously you know about amplifying it and how you can create false positives and stuff like that where was the first place that you actually heard all of these rumors start to sort of present themselves it was actually facebook just seeing a few comments in local groups on on facebook um and having to be like no that's that's not how it works and then when i came to twitter it's a cesspit here like the misinformation is terrible uh, yeah, and I saw a lot more of it on there. And it's always people that seem to think they have all the answers and they've got no formal education in it, they've got no experience in it, and they're just regurgitating something they've heard somewhere. And they just, it's the easy, easiest way you can you can see whether somebody understands something or not is whether they're conflating CT and cycle number. That's the easiest yeah. way to, to see. But I think that actually originally came from 
Oh, I can't even remember his name. What was the, the chap um, the invented um, PCR? Um, the the raccoon fellow. What was his oh, name? Harry Mullins. <laughs> yeah. Harry Mullins. Yeah. Do like yeah, so just to clarify, that was the sort of where this idea came from. He was being asked to say, well, how come all these AIDS patients seem to have HIV in them? Because he didn't believe that HIV was the cause or precursor to, to AIDS. And his response was, well, if, you know, with this PCR, you can basically just cycle it up and you can find anything in the body. It doesn't mean that you're ill. So just to clarify, that's not a thing that can be done. You can't find anything in anybody just by manipulating the test you couldn't say i HIV in somebody where it wasn't present no i think people like they they misinterpret what he's saying there i mean he was a he was an AIDS denier uh, he had a lot of yes. very questionable views and they do misinterpret what he's saying there because like he's saying that you can find anything in anyone in that if, you, if you're looking for a target and you have like one molecule of that something in say you take a like a swab if it's on the swab and you've got one molecule of that you could run however many cycles and eventually it would be detected. Yeah. But you'd have to be targeting that specific thing and it would have to be present. But people, yeah. sort of, they hear that and they think it's that a SARS-CoV-2 PCR would pick up anything. like. Mm. So you could couldn't it out of, out of nothingness, basically. Out yeah, of the ether. yeah, that doesn't happen. If you have a positive COVID test, you have COVID or have recently had COVID. So my understanding of that Curry Mullis quote was that basically he's kind of been figurative and somebody's pointed out like a massive flaw in his theory, which is that basically we do tend to see HIV in, uh, in, in AIDS patients. What's that about? And he's basically saying, well, that's a confirmation bias. If you're looking for it, you're going to find it. But he's not saying that you can create it. He's basically trying to sort of poo-poo the idea that basically HIV is present in, in AIDS patients. Yes, so. yeah, I think there's a lot of like AIDS denial where people believe that HIV is like present in everybody. Right. Um, and it's yeah, that's one of the sort of the things floating around bits of mis misinformation in the whole AIDS denial group is that HIV. Oh, is so so he was saying that basically this this is like looking for skin cells or something. You're gonna yeah, find it in yeah, everybody. I, I think so. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, he's not like Kerry Mullis is not what I consider I mean I can't really talk I'm not a very good public speaker myself um but he's not he doesn't articulate his points very well and I think that's where a lot of the confusion comes from fair enough and he and you know he was a complicated fellow as well there was a lot of bitterness and against the use of his own sort of invention and the sort of you know and obviously and obviously the, his invention has been sort of modified since then but so so you start to see all of this sort of misinformation. I imagine, to be quite honest, I imagine it's got on your nerves on a sort of professional level. Like, you know, it's like when somebody sits there and tries to explain to me that, oh, you like that heavy metal, like so-and-so or whatever. And it's like, you know, you're not getting it wrong. Stop getting it wrong. Like, was it more akin to that? Yeah, I mean, it was particularly frustrating when I'd correct something on some someone or something and they'd be like, oh, you're just a shill. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to explain something to you, like as somebody who who does this for a living. Like mm. I have, like I'm not an expert. I don't know the like ins and outs of PCR. You'd be better asking a molecular biologist about that. But I know how these tests work and they're like the basics. And mm. um, I'm telling you, like if that's wrong. This is how it's working. And you're just telling me I'm paid. Like yeah. I wish I was paid. <laughs> but yeah, no, it was a uh, it was very very frustrating to like try, even when I was being like so polite. And trying to like take my time to explain something to somebody, and just they were just adamant that they were right, I was wrong, I was paid. And yeah, it does get very, it's very grating, and it's very annoying to see people who who don't have that education or experience on even a basic level like me, mm. just trying to. They're just arrogantly presuming that they know better than the entirety of the medical relevant medical field, and it's just yeah. Like, where where do you get that audacity, really? <laughs> Well, quite. Well, I mean, so, so just to clarify, you work with this like literally every single day. This is this is literally your job. You're doing the PCR test, so you know how they work. You know how they can be manipulated or how they can't be manipulated. You know all about this. So when you get into a conversation with somebody and you'd say, basically, well, I work with these things, how, very, how quickly would the conversation go to, well, you're just lying? Would, would they ever sort of talk to you about points about the actual PCR or would it it, it just disintegrates it to switch it. instantly to your line or you're paid ah. or someone's 77th brigade all this pretty much instantly they just or it would just be an instant block they just wouldn't want right. to wouldn't want to go there yeah 
there wasn't a lot. So we, I revealed that there wasn't a lot of discussion to be had. Uh, there was no, there was no even sort of okay. Well, so and so as Kerry Mullis has said this, for example, explain it in your own words where where you think that he's incorrect or something like that. Nobody wanted to actually hear your opinion. They just wanted to, they just wanted to be right and continue to be wrong. Sometimes they they would do that. They thought, well, Kerry Mullis said this, and then I'd already have, I'd already heard it before already yeah. have an answer for them you know it's the same talking points over and over and over again mm-hmm. that's interesting i find that sometimes as well it's like you had an answer to that pretty quickly it's like well did, yes <laughs> <laughs> it's almost as if we sort of know the subject or have done some sort of research in it even on a very cursory level like and that that does seem to sort of annoy people so um so the attitude of people was it universally terrible um or i would say like a good 95% of the time, it was pretty terrible. Um, right. I have very, very rarely had a decent conversation with, with a science denier or anti-vaxxer or COVID denier, whatever you want to call them, tend to be sort of like in the same in the same group. Um, mm. Yeah, very, very rarely had a decent conversation. Um, it usually devolves into some accusations of uh, of lying or being a, being a shill or something. Fair enough. And what was your tactic? Would you basically put just stuff on your own timeline? Um, there is this, you know, I don't know how it works, something like there's a rumor that you can up the cycles on PCR. I work with PCR, this can't be done, that sort of thing. Or would you actually sort of go into different people's pages and go, oh, hi, guys, I see that you, you, you've picked up on this uh, idea. That's inaccurate. Or, or did you go to them? Did they come to you? How did that work? Most of the time, they came to me because I, I mm. would do. I would sometimes get tagged into threads to respond to something because people would know okay. what I was talking about. Very, very rarely would I go to somebody else's thread. and Not rarely. I'd say, like, uncommon that I would go to somebody else's thread and yeah. correct them. It tended to be I would be tagged in, I'd do the correction, or, like, I'd make a thread on it. So I did a, actually a thread on PCR and the too many cycles uh, talking point. So I'd do, like, a thread on it, and then people could then copy it in. Even I could copy it my own thread in because I got yeah. so tired of repeating myself. And then I'd have people coming to my threads to sort of spout these things. And, and yeah, so it's most, mostly people coming to me. Okay. Do you have your own website or anything like that? Or just, uh, are you just on Twitter and socials? Um, I'm just on Twitter. I actually, um, because of some recent events, I have deleted all of the social media. Um, oh, right. I don't have any, uh, any websites or anything, though. It's just Twitter. But just to establish that it's just literally, it's just you... Um, you're just a person on your own. You're not part of a sort of a broader group. You're not part, part of any organisation like Hope Not Hate or Campaign Against Disinformation Online or anything like that. You're just somebody who happens to work in an industry that became very sort of popular due to world events. People would tag you in um, and say, no, it's all right. My mate works in this field. You're mistaken here. Here she is. She'll tell you uh, uh, where it goes wrong. There's no sort of financial benefit. There's no. There's no sort of like it's not your job to go online and, and and teach people about PCR or to stir the waters or or anything like that. No, you just absolutely not. Nothing like I'm completely independent. I'm just a mm. young woman. I work for the NHS. I do the COVID testing. I get paid a pretty shitty salary because it's the NHS, and I don't get any any financial compensation for my activity on Twitter. I have never been paid a penny for it. Okay, so so tell us a bit about what sort of ended up happening then on on Twitter. In regards to to these types of people, you mean why I've uh, deleted all my social media? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I have uh, been on the receiving end of a year long stalking and harassment campaign by a particular individual. When you're um, debunking information on on Twitter, misinformation on Twitter, rather, you do end up being being attacked. I think everybody, like both of yourselves, have probably been on the receiving end of a lot of vitriol. No, Brent has. It happens. Uh, you expect it. I always try like not really to engage very much. And there are like certain names, certain accounts which have been quite unpleasant for me. But there was this one individual and he took things way too far. It has been going on for a year. So it all like for some context, it all started off. So I had witnessed a certain mental health professional behaving very unprofessionally on Twitter. Mm. He would post screenshots of other professionals post and post disparaging captions on them and i witnessed him dox the name and workplace of somebody i mutually followed on twitter and um sorry it's just a child outside 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's just completely thrown me now. Um, you you said you, this mental health professional was doxing people yeah, and being so he, professional. Wrong. Yeah, he doxed a mutual friend. Uh, well, she wasn't actually a, she was a, a friend in terms of like we publicly interacted quite a lot. We had not exchanged any private messages at that point. We weren't like good friends. And I saw him dox her, her mm. name and her workplace, and he posted it on his Twitter. And then a few months later, up in my for you feed come that like, comes this man called James Hogcroft, and he is doing an investigative docu series on this mental health professional. Um, right. And having seen how he behaved, I was in support of this. He's also anti-mask. He's anti-vaccine. So I was like, "That's fine. Like, investigate away. There's nothing wrong with that." And uh, my association with James, I followed him, interacted with him a few times. That's what made me a target. And I know that's what made me a target because that is what I have been told essentially by this person is that I'm a target because of this. And he's also told other people that they're targets of him because of this. Um, well, so this this man that has been harassing me is doing so on behalf of this mental health professional. Um, oh, I see. So he's like a fan or so that it's been sort of utilised like a sort of flying monkey. Um, I don't know whether the mental health professional is uh, encouraging the behaviour. No, but, but he I feels think. that he's probably... He's doing it because he's like he wants to. He wants to show that he's on the side of the mental health professional, and yes. so so he, they've yeah. got a vendetta against you, and he feels that it's his position to stick up for his buddy or whatever. Yes, yeah, and I have actually um, heard in the grapevine that this mental health professional has described this individual as his best friend. So I oh. think there's a yeah, uh, there's a friendship there. So it was, I think it was in June last year it started, um, and I would be tagged into these posts with screenshots of things james had said um mm. and there were things that you could tell from the screenshot they'd been said in anger they'd been said in retaliation for something so i was just like yeah. i don't tend to if somebody posts screenshots of something someone said like look at this person look what they've done i take it with a pinch of salt because i'm like i have no context i'm not just going to believe you straight away i'd need to mm. see the context. so i just knew it's like yeah that's not the whole story and he would post these screenshots tag me in call me names i think the first thing he called me was a pro lamestream troll whatever that's supposed to mean <laughs> um and also said that james was my digital boyfriend and i think he's referred to brent as my digital boyfriend at some point as well. <laughs> oh, <not> boyfriends <laughs> um buy me jewelry <laughs> um, <laughs> so um yeah i just would respond to him and i said oh, i don't i don't know who you are and i muted him mm -hmm. and then a few days later he popped up on another account same behavior same person said again i don't know who you are i'm gonna mute you and then another account and this happened like six or seven times and i was just getting mm. more and more annoyed like just piss off like stop tagging me into your drama with other twitter, twitter users i don't care like i'm not james's mum. i you know mm. i've you know it's not my business like yeah and eventually it's sort of like quietened down happening only occasionally and then i got informed by um this friend of mine was uh, just by this mental health professional. I'll just call her Bex. It's not her real name. But so Bex, yeah. she, uh, she contacted me and she was like, I, uh, I really think you should report this guy to the police. And she sent me some screenshots of his getter. And I had a look and for months he had been screenshotting my content on Twitter and posting right. it with abuse and harassment, sometimes sexual harassment. And I was just like horrified just to find this had been happening for months. And they weren't even posts that were about him, just completely irrelevant like stuff. I'd just been like debunking something and he posts a screenshot of that with with some abuse. And I was like, right, I'm gonna I'm gonna monitor this. So I, I did. Um mm. and in sort of late December, in fact it was New Year's Eve. I remember this because it was just before midnight and actually spoiled my New Year's Eve completely because I was so angry. Um mm. he took a screenshot of the conversation I was having with somebody on Twitter where they told me that COVID was over. And I said, well, it's not co over for me because I'm still processing the uh, body parts of dead pediatric COVID victims on my laboratory bench. And so that's not yeah. over at all. And he took a screenshot of this and wrote that I had gone mad because I was playing with the body parts of dead children. And God. I just saw red. I was like, that is disgusting. Oh. Not just like my instant thought, like I don't really get offended very easily. But it was more like that. How disrespectful to those children and their families mm -hmm. to say something like that. Um, least of all to me. I was just so I was so angry. I was like, at that point, I was like, right, this is like the police are getting involved. I'm not having this. So that's when I yeah. started documenting it all. 
yeah, so I, I retrospectively went back through everything. Back to June, I had initial screenshots of our of the first times he contacted me, and I started putting together. It took me so long, but started putting together like a, a like a, a file, like different documents with all, all of this in, and it like it didn't stop. And I think in it was in January, I posted. I was, I was thinking like, am I going to contact the police? I need to like I have check boxes for things that like is he going to claim the, to the police that I'd never told him to stop? Is he going to claim that he didn't realise I was uncomfortable? So I started mm-hmm. going through this checkbox. I was like, right, I need to tell him to stop. So I posted on my Twitter a, a message to him, addressed him by name, and I said, you need to stop doing this, stop stalking my accounts. And for informational purposes, I was blocking every single one of his accounts. Every single one that yep. popped up, I blocked them, and he would get around that block with a new account. Um, so I was just trying my best just to get him out of my life. Yeah, so I, I, I posted this, th- this thread saying, you know, you need to stop doing this for legal purposes going through forward. I want to make it abundantly clear. I have asked you to stop. And I well, I didn't, I wasn't going to make a getter account to contact him directly on there. That was not happening. They're not having my information. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, I, uh, he, he then made a, another Twitter account and started attacking me on there. And he likes to use fake names, but it's all always very clearly it's him. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so my next on my list was, um, well, I, I tried locking down, tried locking down my account. That doesn't work. Used, I did it for weeks, made no difference. He'd still post about me, even though I was locked down. As soon as I was unlocked, it would be like full full steam ahead. Um, mm. All the information online about stalking says to ignore it, which I had already done because I didn't know what was happening behind my back for months. I tried publicly discussing involving the police because I knew, and all of this that I'm saying is all public information, just want to put that out there. Yeah. He posted on his guesser that he had been arrested in January for harassing James Hogcroft. And I thought, well, if I mention that I'm involved in the police, that might put him off. And maybe like a sensible person would just not want to go there again. Yeah. Um, so I mentioned the police and I also thought, well, maybe he doesn't realise the extent of what he's doing. So I started discussing like the evidence that I had that I would bring forward to the police. So all the the sexual harassment, uh, the, the veiled threats, um, the abuse. And then the amount of stalking, how many screenshots I had at that point. I discussed the evidence, hoping that maybe he'd think, oh shit, like I, I am allowed to swear on here, aren't I? Of course, sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I, I thought he, maybe he'd think, oh shit, like I've, I've crossed the line here, this has gone too far. No, that didn't mm-hmm. stop him. And I tried to directly address him as well. So I would reply to his posts, like telling him, leave me alone, leave me alone. This is on Twitter at this point, so he'd made what was probably his 50th Twitter account. I found evidence on his getter of him gloating about having had 46 accounts suspended. And that was mm. in December, and I know he's had six since at least. So yeah, I'd be responding to him, telling him to leave me alone. And and I tried reasoning with him, and I said, with regards to like the sexual harassment, I posted a screenshot from, there's a charity called Rape Crisis, and I posted, posted a screenshot of their definition of sexual harassment, and I said, like, it should mm. be a fucking wake-up call to you the this screenshot on rape crisis this describes your behavior to a t like that should be mm-hmm. way cool. no he decided to twist that and play the victim claiming that i was accusing him of rape um mm-hmm. yeah it went on and on and i was like i, I sent in my report to the police and um sent my initial evidence and whilst i was waiting for them to respond i experienced um a very unfortunate health condition I spoke about it openly on my um, on my account because it's a a very rare hypersensitivity reaction. It's called Lipschitz ulcers, um, mm. and it's um, extensive genital ulceration, and it is so horrific. I'm pretty sure I have PTSD from it. Would not wish it on my worst enemy. I had a horrible time, six weeks of, of agony. Yeah, I thought it was important yeah. as like a, a rare condition for me to discuss it, not just for patient benefit, but, but also for for men, uh, for um healthcare professionals on on twitter yeah um especially as like during my journey for this for a diagnosis i've been told it was herpes when it wasn't i had a negative test oh, yeah. um, so they constantly tried to tell me it was herpes i was like this is, this is not herpes um mm. so um yeah and i had i think seven people come forward to tell me that they had experienced the exact same thing been given a herpes diagnosis despite a negative test and never really thought anything of it never had it again and I had a couple of healthcare professionals come forward and tell me that they had learned something, including a gynecologist. They'd never heard of it before. Oh. Yeah, so I thought I've done, I've done some good. Even yeah, yeah, that's great. Uh, brilliant. 
So I wouldn't take that back for the world. But yeah, it was a horrific experience. And unfortunately, uh, this stalker weaponized that. Um, right. And he would he posted the most vile things I've ever read on social media, like sexual harassment. It was disgusting. I'm not going to repeat it. Um, mm-hmm. But I was just screenshotting everything, just screenshotting it, creating a document entirely for the evidence of sexual harassment. And eventually the police came back to me and the first response I got from them was that an offence hasn't been committed because he's responding to things you've posted. There's no sexual harassment. He's responding to things you've posted. And I was just like, these things I posted are nothing to do with him. For example, like I responded to Dr. Graham Botley with a Shrek gif and he had taken a screenshot of that and captioned, posted it on his getter and captioned it that I was giving Graham monthly blowjobs. Right. And he took a screenshot of me giving Brent a music recommendation and posted mm-hmm. that screenshot saying Brent was sniffing my knickers and just just weird, creepy stuff like that. So I sent an email back to this officer and I listed each of these instances and I said, these have nothing to do with him. He's not responding mm-hmm. to things about him. He's not responding to things sent to him. He is just taking screenshots of things that have nothing to do with him and posting it with this lewd commentary. And I actually, they gave me a little bit of a Karen and I quoted, like, when, I don't know if you have ever reported anything to the police, but they always offer for victim support to contact you. And mm-hmm. victim support work in tandem with the police to provide support of a victim, self-explanatory. And I sent back to this officer the definition of sexual harassment from the victim support website. And I said, this is your resource. This is what it mm-hmm. says. This describes his behavior. And then I was like, I'm going to attach some more evidence here. And it was a sexual harassment documentation. And I actually attached it. It was on my OneDrive initially. And I attached the OneDrive link. And I said, if you, uh, re- I want you to have a look at this. If you still decide there's no crime been committed, I want your duty sergeant to review this and respond to me in writing with the reasons why you will not be proceeding to investigate this. And um, it took a while, but I got a response back and she was like, oh, um, we can't actually see, uh, we can't click on links to OneDrive because our security systems don't allow us to. Can you send it another way? And I'd sent all my initial evidence on OneDrive and she hadn't told me that. So she hadn't really investigated any of it to start oh, with right oh <laughs> okay so we've not actually bothered oh. to check any of the yeah at all. I, I sent her a document initially and it had a onedrive link saying oh there's far more examples of malicious communications on my onedrive in the screenshot bank and she didn't tell me at that point that she couldn't access it right but yeah so i sent her the document separately and i sent her one that was specifically to show that all the accounts were him one that was sexual harassment only then i had mm. december january february march april may some of these documents were 80 pages long there were so many screenshots in the end i had over a thousand uh yes <laughs> and uh she got back to me and she was like oh um it's gonna take me a little while to go through this and i was like you know, take your time because i know it's a mm. lot <laughs> and she asked if i could go to my local uh police um force and give a statement to them so that's what i did went to a local police officer who was very nice very understanding she was all all on my side. She she really wanted this dealt with. I mm. pulled my eyes out to her over the sexual harassment, particularly in regards to my um my condition, because it was just so vile. And to like to be suffering physically and then have that as well on top of it, it was just he, he wasn't the only one doing it, but he was like the most frequent and the most mm. like determined to yeah. Yeah. And then last month I finally get a phone call from the police that he was arrested and he was given a Conditional caution. He was the conditions are that he had to write an uh, apology letter to me, which I said to the officer at the time. It's not going to be genuine. He doesn't mean it. He's not sorry. <laughs> he, he knew he was making it me uncomfortable. I told him. I told him to leave me alone multiple times. He's not sorry. But since it was a first offence of this kind, she um, she wanted to give him a, a conditional caution. And the other condition was that he was not to contact me in any way, directly or indirectly. And uh, yeah, but by this point, I had already nuked my main account. I did that at the end yeah. of June. I wanted to be seen by the police to be doing everything that was recommended, everything everything right, so that if it went to court, they could not say to me, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to do everything right, be like 10 steps ahead. And, um, yeah, so I'd already – I have a new account now, which people know is me because I've spoken openly about the stalking on there already. But um, mm-hmm. – 
I, I, I've been using that accounts before anybody knew it was me on anybody on that like anti vax side. It's before this creepy stalker knew it was me. And because I obviously had the same friends on Twitter, I had the same inter- people in, I was interacting with, he, <laughs> without knowing it was me, he targeted me again. I right. got screenshots of my content again and posted it. I was thinking, like, yeah. he has no idea it's me, but like, just goes to show the pattern of behavior here. Um, yeah. And I did actually eventually comment in capital saying, leave me alone. And it's what I kept had kept doing on my previous account. So that's how he knew it was me. And he did. Did that stop him from yeah, carrying on? He, yeah, he has been, he still targets other people. In fact, his right. others has probably increased now that he's not, he's not got me to. He's not got you to direct his energy there. Yeah. He's okay. also made sort of like remarks about how he wants to. Now he wants to sue, and like, although it's not, he hasn't like tagged me or referred to me directly. I'd, I'd, it, I'd encourage him to do so. Like, you know, if he wants to waste his money, get him to do that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've got, I've got so much evidence, and also, like, a police caution in the UK is an admission of guilt. No yeah. lawyer is going to be interested if somebody has admitted to the crime. So, no. like, go ahead, like, try it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean that that sounds horrible. The most disappointing thing, I suppose, is out of all of it, it was the um the response of the police. It's like yeah. lackluster to say the very least. Like, yeah. um, I mean, I, I don't get me wrong, I do understand that the police are very, very snowed under and they're very, very busy. But like, that looks like looking for an opportunity to just have something by. Like, you know what I mean? Like, the the I mean, it's very clear they didn't actually look at your evidence because their actions once they seen your evidence was completely uh, contradictory yeah. to their previous actions. So yeah, and it's like I did so I basically did all of the legwork for them, and they still weren't mm. interested. Yeah, because um, I was thinking when I when I decided I was going to report him, I was thinking I'm going to have to like UK police are known to be pretty useless, so I'm going to have yeah. to I'm going to have to really do a lot of work, gather a lot of evidence, make these links with his accounts to other things to prove it's him. Um, mm. I'm going to have to do so much investigating of my own to act for them to actually even consider it because it's it's online crime. And actually, the um, the officer I I spoke to and took my statement, the local one, she was explaining to me like in our local police force there are only two cybersecurity officers. Yep. Which is horrific. Um, That's terrible. Yeah. Considering that so much is online now, mm. um, she said, "Yeah, it's it's not because of issues with funding in the police. It's not caught up with." on like the online world yeah and not just the capabilities of the police either but the, the laws there's not enough laws surrounding it yeah i mean uh, yeah it, it, uh, i have a friend that works for the police and he says that ironically a lot of the, all that sort of efforts are going towards uh people texting their exes and calling them like a bitch or something like that and basically oh, they've got the evidence there so they'll prosecute that and and they've, they've, they they it takes apparently a huge amount of their time at the minute, basically just prosecuting people with malicious communications for calling their ex a bitch or something very very similar. And the detriment of that is that when there's sort of more sort of you know organised uh, campaigns like with yourself, that that tends to be it's more complex, isn't it? So in order for them to have the that sets aside the time to even begin to look at it, it it's it it. Uh, well, you can see why people just through human nature would, would not do it. But that's appalling, isn't it? Like, you know, yeah. I mean, it's... it's, uh, it's um, I was anxious enough sort of like reporting it to the police because like there's always the possibility that you're going to get victim blamed for it, especially yeah, yeah, of reporting a sexual crime. The stories you hear about being victim blamed and I just, I would, do, would not want to deal with that because like, it would be so upsetting to be... No, of course not. That. So it's it's already like distressing enough as it is even just reporting it to the police, knowing that that could happen. Mm. And it's like it's a very anxious time for me because I'm like you rely so much, having done all the work, you rely so much on them doing their job. Yeah, um, of course. So to be told like, oh, he's just responding to posts you've made. Like I'm using social media, how people use social media, and I should be able to without. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's absolutely done. Uh, that you've just unfortunately you've found the radar of, and again, I suppose. You've got to look for silver linings anywhere, but one silver lining is that this is the actions of a deeply sad person. This is mm-hmm. like an, an impotent person in, in probably every sense of the word. Like it, it's, 
it's born out of a frustration that comes from an inadequacy in the real world. And th this is what, what people do. They'll put themselves into roles where they'll convince themselves that through these sad, petty actions, that they actually have some sort of raison d'etre. Uh, and and th this is the thing. Is it's very, very easily, particularly with the anonymity of the internet, for people who've got massive chasms in their existence to want to fill it with this sort of tragic cosplay um, activism, essentially. Uh, and so it, it, I know it's, 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 it's not much comfort, but the fact is that this is a, this is a sad, broken, pathetic person that, that is the, these are the actions of somebody that is like a worm or, or, you know, a germ on a slide, like something like that. I mean, obviously it's no, it's no comfort when these things are happening to you, but I suppose in retrospect, you can frame it and look at this, this, this person and go that they're a tragedy. They're, they're an absolute hopeless tragedy. They're not, they're, they're not dangerous. They make, make con themselves that they're, they're scary in some way or something like that but it's actually just it's juvenile really isn't it it, it it's akin to phoning people up from the phone box and stuff like that and it's just like <laughs> yeah it, 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 i've it had just, a few run-ins uh, with the guy is that is exactly what it's like yeah but but what's so tragic about it as well is that they'll fondly imagine themselves as as to doing some good They'll have framed you as some sort of government agent or something yeah. and really yeah. thought that their stupid, childish actions are, are, are in some way making the world a better place. And the absolute opposite is the truth about that. And it's just, uh, it, it's just, it's horrible. I'm, I'm so glad that something got sorted out uh, about it. But it's just, it's just a shame that this person continues to do things to other people because, yeah. you know, I mean, what yeah. a lot of waste of everyone's time aside from anything else. <laughs> like, I but, honestly, uh, I genuinely, I know people throw away, throw around mental health as an insult, but I genuinely don't think he's well. I don't no, think no, evidently. To, to do that to someone, to do it with multiple people, because I'm not his only victim, yeah. to make over 50 Twitter accounts to stalk and harass people yeah. for years. I mean, I spoke to somebody not long ago who said it's been going on for him since 2010. Mm. Um, and it, it was just, you, there's got to be something wrong there. And I said that to the well, police it, officer. It, I said, like, part of my police report is actually, like, I'm really hoping that the police can get him some help. Yes. Yeah, it, it, this is a person that has no power or influence on any aspect of existence. And this is the only the way that he can somehow make himself feel, you know, like he... Like he's more than a collection of organs and a shadow. Like, yeah. and he must be very, very lonely because he also harasses anti vaxxers. Um, yeah, he, yeah, he's he's fallen out with a couple of them, and there's a particular woman who he always goes for, and he will use fake names. And recently, he actually um, used a fake name. I think the name he he was like Bradley or something. He um, mm. he messaged her, and he was sending her like messages about ravishing her. And it was, they were just disgusting. And she'd already previously told him publicly to leave her alone. Reading these mm. messages, it made me feel a bit sick. I was like, that's just, that's mm. disgusting. And when she found out it was him, she was like, for the last time, I'll leave you alone. This is really weird. And I actually, mm. I did, she is actually one of the anti-vaxxers who pretty relentlessly um, attacked me with some rather vile comments about the Lipschitz ulcers. Um, yeah. Some of the worst abuse came from her. But I put that aside and I was like, right, well, since she's also a target of this guy, Oh, so this guy's just show. just targeting anybody and anybody that he thinks he can get a rise yeah. out of. Basically. I think he, so wasn't, was... he was initially friends with her, and then yeah. she would not join in with his doxing. I think he he tagged yeah. her in a post where he had doxed James Hogcroft. He posted a an aerial view of his house, and mm. this woman was like, "I'm not. I don't want any part of this." Yeah, and he called her names because of that, and then they found I mean, that. Quite prominent people within the conspiracy world, like Richard D. Hall's going to bother for doxing people. Chris Bibby got into problems for doxing people, and they're giving out names and addresses. Like, is it, I, I think that the internet affords the anonymity and also basically the media and stuff like that. People don't realise that some of these things that they're doing, they could, they could, you know, land you in lumber. To be quite honest. Yeah, exactly. Like, but yeah, I um, there's something so silly as well. Like, do you know what I mean? And, and it's. I, you know, pathetic, really. It but 
But he, yeah, he get, he attacks pretty much anyone. Anyone he falls out with is a target. But he's strange. Mm. It's almost like he doesn't like this woman, but he will like message her about ravishing her. It's really bizarre. But yeah, I, I put, the fact that she had attacked me, I was like, right, I'm just going to put that aside and I'm going to try and I'm going to reach out. And I contacted her mm. and I said, look, like I've got details that you'll need to go to the police if you want this guy yeah. with. I'm more than happy to help. You can have my crime reference number so that the police can tie it into this. And I'm more than happy to be a witness in a court case if it gets that far. Um, mm-hmm. Like, I'm happy to do that. And like, and like for the sake of like his other victims as well, some of whom have been very young women. Um, really? Yes. He, he would like post videos. He likes to post videos around his flat. He doesn't film himself. He just films his flat. And there'll be things like bits of paper in view of the video, which I'm sure are placed there on purpose as an intimidation tactic. But mm. there'll be people's usernames written on them. Um, right, right. Okay. So the, this young woman, she, I think she's like 23. He'd written her mm. name down and she was freaked out. I, I told her about it because I was like, just, just so you're aware, like this has happened. And mm-hmm. uh, she completely freaked out over it. Um, he's done it with loads of people. But yeah, so I, I, I said to this, this anti-vax lady, I said, um, let's, you know, I'm willing to put this all aside. Like, I think we should put this aside and trying to deal with this. Just not like, because I've got my justice now. He's been cautioned. He's not going to come for me. But I mm-hmm. can do some good still. And I can help him because he's not stopped. He's no, shown no genuine remorse for what he did to me. And I no. can help his other victims. I can help it stop for his other victims. So I thought I'd try to reach out to her. Unfortunately, I was thrown back on my face. But I, mean, well, I tried. I, I you know, yeah. at least I tried to be the bigger person. Um, yeah, absolutely. So that's where I'm at with it. Um, we'll see if there's a. We'll see if he tries to see me. Um, well, yeah, oh, yeah, John could he'll try and yeah. That I'd love to see him. I'd absolutely love to see him try and do that. What's he going to sue you for? Not responding to his sexual harassment? Like, is that? <laughs> yeah. a... I'd like, like suing me for whatever he wants to sue me for will be in direct breach of his conditional caution. It'll be either direct or indirect contact with me. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd also, I'll just counter sue for the rest of them. We'll see how that goes. Funny, like, <laughs> True. And it, 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 it's just, it's fantasy, isn't it? This, this, this bloke's obviously, like, got a limited relationship with reality. Like, um, he, 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 he lives in the sort of grandiose sort of status thing inside, like, his forehead. But, like... Yeah. I mean, this is the thing. Like, I think the lessons we take from that is, like, it's horrible... What what happened to you? And I think that sometimes you're right that people don't appreciate what, like the the results of their actions. But I think it's also easy to get swept up in these sorts of things and like position yourself as like you know a, a fighter or whatever against against a horrible entity like the government or whatever. And you know what? If you're really doing that, you really need to step back and take a look at yourself and just go like you know chill out, okay, just calm down <laughs> because it's it. You, you're not doing all the things that you think you're doing and you actually you just you're being a dick and that's not why the, the irony is that's what not, not why people have got into conspiracy stuff like you know we, we'll probably disagree about the, the covid and whatnot like with with this guy but like he's gone into it because he thinks he's doing a good thing i think that's that's the tragedy of getting too deep into these things, into the, the rabbit hole or whatever you want to say is that you start acting like a wanker but basically, you think that you're a good person, and that's it. It, it, it. You you fundamentally failed at the one thing that you're trying to achieve with this hidden knowledge, and, and and again, that's another thing that people need to be careful of. Because let's be honest, right? Okay, when it comes to conspiracy stuff, that hidden knowledge that I know something that you don't know, I know this. Okay, it's a power thing. Is the power like there's a degree of power, the power of hidden knowledge, the power of, of of being one step ahead of the normies or whatever, and it's very seductive to take that power and and take it to dark dark places like they do with yourself, where basically they're using that as a as a tool for harassment. And again, if you find yourself doing that, you need to take a long hard look in the mirror. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining us, Nat. Thank you for telling your story. Oh yeah, thank you very much for that. I'm very glad it's um, it's it's worked out for you. Like you know that it's uh, but but just keep an eye on it. Like the second he starts being a twat again, just come down and uh, like a ton of bricks because yeah. it, it appears to be the only language that they understand. Really, basically, like you know, it's a game. It's all in his head. He's fighting fucking 
demons and Martians and shit like that. Like, but you know, when the police turn up and say, "No, you're sharing a cell with this bloke that hates you," it all becomes very real. And um, you know, so sometimes you have to do stuff like that.